Great to see you. Um, I was asked a really important question week, uh, this week. Um, someone came to me and they said this. How do I know that Christianity is true? It's a good question, isn't it? I wonder if you have questions like that. You know, we're in a series about following in the footsteps of Jesus. I mean, if you're going to radically shape your life around what Jesus says, you kind of want to be sure it's true, yeah? You know, I remember in my teenage years having the exact same question. I'd gone to church all my life, and I wondered, maybe I only believed in Christianity because that's what I'd been taught. You know, many other people sincerely believe in other religions or no religion. How do I know this is true? I wonder how you would answer that. Maybe you're not sure. You know, over the years, I've actually asked that question many times. So what's the answer? Why do I still believe and follow Jesus? Well, part of me wishes that I could give you just a a few simple facts, kind of undeniable kind of proof that means that it's like a slam dunk case. You just couldn't deny it. Um, A truth that is impossible to refute. But if I'm honest, I can't. Now, don't mishear me. There are lots of compelling reasons, lots of evidence for Jesus, for what he did, for who he is. Uh, Of course, the evidence for for Christ's resurrection is, is quite overwhelming. And some people, just based on that evidence, actually choose to believe in Jesus. And yet other people look at the same evidence and don't believe. Why? You know, some people say, well, seeing is believing. If I could see God, you know, if I'd been there, if, I, if I'd seen Jesus and, and, and been there at the time, then I'd believe. But this is perhaps one of the most interesting and confusing things around belief is that there were many people who saw Jesus, saw the miracles he did, and yet still refused to believe. So what creates faith in a person? You know, as I've been thinking about that, I've realized that the answer that we're looking for and that this person was looking for is not simply an intellectual one, sort of points of evidence. But what this person was kind of asking was, what do I do when my faith kind of doesn't just doesn't feel real? You know, what do I do when I have doubts and, and questions? Why does that happen? And that's why I want to explore today how faith is birthed and how faith is sustained. How do we hear this voice of God? How do we know he's for real? And the answer to this question comes not in something kind of we do for God, but in something that God needs to do for us. You know, if you, if you try to believe in Jesus, if you even try to pray and read the Bible and follow Jesus without this thing your faith will go nowhere. Look at John the Baptist's message. John was this fiery preacher in the wilderness that people were flocking to because he was saying something really exciting. Essentially, his message was, get ready, something amazing is about to happen, okay? And this is what he says, verse 8. I, John, baptize with water, but he, this is Jesus the Messiah, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John says there's a fundamental difference between him and what he does and what Jesus does. In fact, this is true of everyone other than Jesus. You see, water baptism works on the outside of us. That's how kind of religion works. It works on the outside of us. But what Jesus is going to do is something that works from the inside out by the Holy Spirit. If your faith is weak, if you're not sure if things are true, if you actually want to believe, if you want life with God to actually work, what you need are not just clever answers. What we need is the Holy Spirit. We need to be baptized. To be baptized means to be drenched, to be immersed, to be filled with the Spirit of God. Are you full? You know, the Spirit 
is absolutely fundamental both to the beginning of faith, but also our ongoing experience of faith and our life with God. So how do we receive the Spirit? How do we be a full people? Well, the first thing is we need to get ready. Jesus is getting ready to begin his ministry. Not with a great teaching session or an amazing miracle, but an encounter with his Father through the Holy Spirit. You know, that is our greatest need for life with God. An encounter with God the Father through the Spirit enabled by Jesus the Son. How does that happen? Well, we see in the baptism of Jesus these three persons of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. In Genesis 1 verse 2, we see the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. He's described as the the breath of God. He's described as the counselor, the comforter, the teacher. He's the one who brings the presence of God into people's lives. Let me back up a moment. Why are people flocking to John in the desert? You know, if there was a kind of crazy-looking preacher eating locusts on the downs... You wouldn't expect all of Brighton to be talking about it, would you? Well, not in this way. (laughs) Yeah? But the the, the whole of the country is kind of like just going, wow, what's happening? And they're flocking to see him. Why? Well, Mark begins actually his gospel with some quotes from the Old Testament because he wants us to see that what is happening here is directly related to what has already happened. So God's people... At this moment, they are waiting for a fulfillment of a promise. And Mark quotes two scriptures. He he quotes the prophet Malachi and then the prophet Isaiah in verse 3 to remind us of the promise. Malachi 3 says, a messenger will come. That's John. A messenger will come. And then after this messenger, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. God's going to suddenly show up. Isaiah says, and promises comfort and hope for God's people with their sin being paid for, their world restored, Isaiah 40. That is what they're waiting for because hundreds of years before this, when the, when the Babylonians took over and conquered them and destroyed the temple, the, the, the Spirit of God departed from the temple. And even though they've over the, the, the following kind of centuries, they've been back and they've rebuilt the temple. The Spirit of God had never come back to the, to the temple. And so they're waiting for this moment. And John the Baptist comes, looking like Elijah and says, look, this, this moment has come. Get ready. God is coming. And so just like if you were going to have a special guest to your home, you'd be getting ready. Yeah, The people are getting baptized, getting ready, asking for forgiveness. So they are ready for the return of God's spirit to the temple and for the coming of this Messiah, this king who's been promised. Are you ready? You know, at the at the very kind of most basic level, if you want the Spirit of God, you have to be wanting Him. Yeah? You have to actually desire this promise. Are you ready? Get ready. Secondly, we need to get close to Jesus. Because actually, it's only Jesus who can truly get us ready. You cannot have the Spirit without Jesus. And you cannot have Jesus without the Spirit. Let me try and explain. Something strange happens here. Jesus, the Messiah, comes and he asks to be baptized. And then verse 10, it says, heaven was torn open. It's quite a violent word. It's almost this this moment where you're thinking, oh, is this the judgment of God going to fall? 
And then something strange happens. The spirit descends, not with fire, but like a dove in gentleness. And then strangest of all, the spirit descends not to the temple, but onto a person, onto Jesus. What does this mean? Well, just remember the temple was all about. The temple was the holy place of meeting with God, okay? The temple was the place that heaven touched earth. It was the only place that happened. And yet, yet it wasn't somewhere you could just kind of, people could just go into. It was a holy place. It was a place where the presence of God was there, but people were at a distance because of their sin. Yet here God's spirit comes and rests on a person, on Jesus. And here's the point. The place of meeting with God is changing from the temple to Jesus. Yeah? The place where heaven is touching earth is changing from the temple to Jesus. Why? Well, a voice comes from heaven to explain. Verse 11 says, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Here we get a glimpse into the most amazing, loving relationship there has ever been. The Father's boundless love for his son that's been there for all eternity. God reveals Jesus' identity. He says, he is, my, he is the son of God. He is loved. And before his ministry even begins, the father says he is well pleased with him. You know, this is the key to everything that flows and follows from um, Jesus' ministry Jesus knows who he is. He knows that he's loved. And he knows that God is pleased with him. Why is faith and life so hard sometimes? It's often because we're not sure who we are. We're not sure we're loved. And we're not sure really what God thinks of us. And certainly we wonder whether... He's pleased. And you might say, well, surely well, God doesn't look at me like he looks at Jesus, does he? That's the extraordinary thing. That's exactly how God looks at us. And you're like, what? But have you seen my life? Have you seen what I've done? Have you seen the mess I've made? Well, this is amazing. This, that's... Um, this is how and this is why God looks at us in the way he looks at Jesus. This is why Jesus comes to be baptized, not for his sake, but for ours. You know, he's, Jesus never sinned. You might think, why is he getting baptized? He doesn't need forgiveness. Well, Jesus here reveals the ultimate mission that he is on. He is rehearsing at the beginning of his ministry what he's going to do at the end of his ministry. Here, he kind of symbolically steps into our place, steps into the place of sinners. He fully identifies with us, stands in our place, just as a few years later, he will hang in our place on the cross. Why? To take our sin. To take all our brokenness, all our mess, and to offer us forgiveness so that the, the things that God says over Jesus, God can say over us. So an amazing exchange can take place. Jesus stands in our place so we can stand in his place as children of God. Isn't that amazing? But in order for that to become a reality, Jesus says, we need the Spirit. Jesus says, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We've all been born of water. That's our first birth. The question is, have you been born of the Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the one who begins faith. We are spiritually dead without the Spirit of God. It's only the Spirit that actually opens our eyes to see who Jesus is, to see what he's done, to see our sin and our need of forgiveness. We need the Spirit. 
But we don't just need the Spirit on that day. When that moment when we believe, we need the Spirit every day. We have to get ready. We have to get Jesus. We have to get hold of our identity. So many of our problems come from forgetting who we are. Romans 8 says this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are what? The children of God, okay? So we're children. That's true. But sometimes we don't always feel like we're the children of God. And so this is why the Spirit comes. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. That's what God does. That's us being saved. And by Him, this is our experience. By him, we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies, kind of witnesses with our spirit that we are God's children. There's this internal work that needs to happen in our hearts, in our spirit, with the Spirit of God as the Spirit comes in and says, don't worry, you are a child of God. What is true is felt. What is true externally becomes true in." Eternally. You know, this is a picture of deep intimacy with God, of total security as his children. If you are a believer in Jesus, you need the Spirit to remind you who you are. And it seems that believers, though, can end up filling their lives with things other than the Spirit. And this is where faith gets derailed so often. So Ephesians 4 says this. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So it's actually possible to grieve the Spirit for whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. You know... Sometimes the reason we don't experience all that God has for us, sometimes we don't feel like God's children is because we're full of other stuff. And so one of the things we actually need to ask the Spirit to do is say, God, can you reveal if there's stuff that's getting in the way of me being full of you? Am I full of something else is the question. What are you full of at the moment? God wants us to be filled with his Spirit so we can know the assurance, assurance that we're his children. And then he wants to empower us for what is next. What is next? Well, get prepared. Get prepared for battle. Get ready, get close to Jesus, get hold of your identity, know who you are, but then get ready for battle. What should we expect if we're full of the Spirit? Jesus Full of the Spirit, where does he get led to? Where does he get led? To the wilderness, to the desert, to a place of barrenness. What happens there? He's tempted, he's tested by God's enemy. It's like this this moment of kind of mountaintop experience, of experiencing the presence of God is then followed by this deep, Darkness and difficulty. Why does trials and desert-like experience often follow deep encounters with God? Have you noticed that in your life? Yeah, I have. It seems that anointing always brings trouble. This is so important because what we see here in the life of Jesus is something that is true for all our lives. And it's this. There is a spiritual battle going on in our lives. Did you know that? The reason, one of the reasons faith is so hard sometimes is because there's an enemy who's trying to rob us and whisper lies into our ears and trip us up and make life difficult and rob us of our joy in God. You know, Ephesians 6 describes this spiritual battle and then says, look, you've got armor that you're supposed to put on. Not just once, you're supposed to put it on daily. Things to cover your head and your heart. Protection. Weapons. Have you got the armor of God on? Maybe you feel like you're in a desert right now. 
You're wondering, how do I get through this? Well, how does Jesus get through this time of testing and difficulty? Well, Mark doesn't tell us very much, but he tells us that he was there for 40 days, which is a really symbolic number. And it's intended to echo another desert experience of God's people. I wonder if you can remember the desert experience of God's people. How long were they in the desert? 40 years. If you know the story, they'd been rescued from Egypt, yeah? Across the Red Sea, God had done this extraordinary miracle, and then they are invited into a new life with God in the promised land. Yeah? That's what God says. Come, I've rescued you. Come and live this new life with me. And they go, oh, bit worried about that, bit fearful, not sure I can trust God. And they step away from the life of God that could have been theirs, and they start wandering in the desert. And sadly, that is a picture so often of our lives. That Jesus done this amazing rescue. He says, you're my child. I've died for your sin. You're forgiven. You're set free. Now come and live this life of the Spirit, the life of freedom with me. And we go, oh, I'm not sure about that. And we start wandering in the desert. And, you know, we miss out. And all that God has for us. Now the people were still provided for in the desert. They were still a saved people in that sense. But they didn't receive all that they could have. So how do we get through the desert? Well there is hope here. Because Jesus comes through the desert, doesn't he? Jesus representing God's people walks the desert path. And he succeeds where God's people fail. How? Well, verse 13 tells us Jesus was with the wild animals and angels attended him. Jesus found supernatural help in his time of difficulty. And you're thinking, if I'm in a desert, what do I do? How did Jesus do it? And we get more details actually in the other gospels where we discover that for every time the enemy comes to him, every time the enemy comes to trip him up and tempt Jesus, he uses the exact same weapons that we have to defeat the enemy, to come through the desert. What does he use? Do you know? The word of God. The word of God. And the enemy has to flee. He combats the lies of the enemy with the truth of God's word, as we were thinking about last week. You know, and as we think about our life with God, you know, as we think about being a people of prayer and people who read God's word. It is the spirit that we need to bring those things to life. Yeah, The spirit is the one who actually helps us pray, sometimes with groans that words can't even express. It's the spirit who brings alive the word of God so that we can use it like the sword it's supposed to be, which is actually the sword of the spirit. We need the Spirit of God. How do we get filled with the Spirit? We need to get asking finally daily. Get asking. Jesus said, ask, and it might be given to you. Is that what he says? No. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek. And you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So the question this morning is, are you asking? Are you asking for more of the Spirit? This week, as you pick up God's word and pray, ask God to fill you with his Spirit. You can ask today, but you can ask tomorrow as well, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday. Ask God to give you insight into his word. Ask God to give you power to face the battles that come your way. Come to Jesus. Come to the one who gave up everything for you so that you could receive everything that is his. 
Heirs of God, we read earlier. Isn't that amazing? That is what is available if we will step into the promises of God. If we will receive his spirit. Shall we pray together? I just want to begin just by giving the time of stillness. We can just do that that thing the Bible says of getting rid of anything that could be in the way. Just ask the Lord, is there anything that's kind of being a blockage at the moment? Anger. Malice. Unforgiveness. Just ask the Lord to search your heart. Lord, as we prepare to share shortly in the meal that you have provided to remind us of how and what you've done so that we can receive your spirit. Lord, search our hearts. See if there's any offensive way in us. And lead us in the path of righteousness that we might receive all that you have won for us. Come, Spirit of the living God. Come and fall afresh on us. Let's sing this song as a prayer. Spirit of the living God.